everybody, my name is Keith Lewis. Welcome to part three of my introduction to mixing tutorial for the Music Weeklies community. In part one, we took a look at how to set up a mix uh, so that it's easy to work with. In part two, we took a look at some dynamic processing, uh, so compression, equalization, and reverb uh, to further enhance our mix. And then uh, here in part three, we're gonna be looking at putting some finishing touches on a mix. Uh, so, just like we've done with each of the previous videos, uh, let's just start by listening to what we have so far. Now, full disclosure, I did make some changes between part two and now, uh, just because sometimes these things take a little bit more time than I was wanting to spend in a video uh, to make these adjustments, these subtle adjustments to reverb and equalization and compression. Um, and you guys don't need to watch me listen to the same four seconds of audio over and over again, making tiny little adjustments for 20 minutes. Uh, so the biggest things you'll probably notice are that I reduced the reverb and delay times on my electric piano sound and my lead guitar. Uh, I just felt they were sitting a little too far back. Uh, I wanted to pull them forward because they are, after all, lead instruments when they're being used. Uh, so anyway, let's go ahead and take this uh, from the top, give it a listen, and then we'll move into trying to make this sound a little more finished than it is. So that's what we're working with so far. Uh, now, the first thing I like to do when I'm starting to add some polish to a track uh, is I like to make everything sound like it's kind of in the same space. I've got a lot of different uh, timbres going on between the instruments, a lot of different reverbs happening. And I find the most effective way to do that is just to add a reverb bus to everything. Uh, so I actually had a separate track for this, name it appropriately. And then I come down here to the routing and what I'm going to do is actually one of the things I like about Reaper is I just could just go add receives from all tracks. And it just pops a receive. And what that means is now every channel in my project is not just going to the master bus, but is also going through this bus. Now, right now, because there's nothing on the bus, it's just running all of the natural sound through. So I'm just kind of bumping everything up uh, in volume. Uh, but what I'm going to do is actually add 
a reverb to this channel. I'll use my M30. Uh, I find that it's most effective to use a room style reverb as opposed to something like a plate or any kind of fancy reverb that adds a lot of uh, character. You certainly can um, do that if that's the sound you're going for. Um, I just find the most consistent, uh, more subtle effects come from a room sound because I'm not looking to make this uh, really heavily color the audio. Uh, so let's just listen to that. I, I leave it set to 100% and I control the mix with the fader on the channel. So let's just listen to what that did. So you can hear it's really swimming. When I bring in the drums, that's when you'll really notice this. So you can hear everything get a lot less distinct, it's a lot less clear, which means my mix is a little too high, my reverb times are probably a little bit too long. So I'm just going to listen and sort of play with the mix and the reverb time until I get a good balance. off of things um it, it it makes the things that are way out front sit back a little bit and kind of brings everything into the same space which i find is just a really nice effect it adds some nice color to it um it's not a crazy amount like a plate reverb or anything like that or a shimmer reverb um again nothing against those uh, i just find that i like a really subtle effect here uh to help bring everything together make it sound a little more rounded Okay, one thing I forgot to mention that is very, very important is when you're using track folders like I am, make sure that your receives are not doubling your inputs to the reverb bus, which mine are right now. Uh, so you can see I've got my drum bus track, and then I've got each of the individual tracks from the drum bus. I don't need that. So I'm going to go ahead and actually delete all of these uh, that are already feeding to the drum bus because the drum bus is feeding the reverb bus anyway. All right, so let's go ahead and listen back to that just to make sure you didn't screw anything up here. It's not a massive difference from before, uh, but definitely an appreciable one, and I find that it makes the effect even more subtle, which gives me a little bit more control. I can bring it up, uh, bring the reverb mix up just a little bit uh, to enhance that effect. So that's a nice feature of that. Now, if you're going to be mastering your track separately or handing this off to a mastering engineer, stop here. Uh, you do not need to go any further. What you want to do is get your track to a level that gives either yourself or your mastering engineer uh, lots of flexibility and lots of room to breathe. So <clears throat> all I'm going to do to do that is go to probably the loudest section of my song. And I'm just going to take my master fader. I'm going to bring it down so that my peaks are sitting around minus four to minus six ish. Um, it's not totally critical, but it just gives you lots of, gives you and your mastering engineer lots of headroom to play with in the mastering process. So.
because that's sitting in a pretty good place. Um, it's not the loudest track, but that's fine because that will all get handled in the mastering process, which if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, I think starting next month, there will be an excellent mastering tutorial coming from Chris Scribner. Um, now, if you're not going to do that, you just want to print this track on its own and release it. Cool. Let's take a look at how to do that. We're going to bring our master fader back to zero because that's where we like it. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to start to worry about is the overall tone of the track, the overall color, which is mostly handled by EQ. Now, a lot of people will actually put an EQ on their master channel. Uh, what I actually like to do is use something called a multiband compressor and load that up. And if you remember from part two, what a compressor does is it limits dynamic range of an instrument. Uh, and what a multiband compressor does is limits the dynamic range of a frequency range. So you can see I've got four different channels here, each covering different frequencies. And I can change the threshold and ratio of each of those frequency ranges to uh, really either bring things out that I want brought out or to control things that I feel like are really inconsistent. Uh, so let's go ahead and introduce this a little bit. I like to actually start with just kind of a general shape like this, where I'm bringing the low, where I'm compressing the lows and highs a decent amount. I'm lowering my threshold, uh, which is the, remember, the level at which the, the compressor engages. I'm leaving my ratio at two, which is a pretty gentle curve. I don't need a tremendous amount of compression when I'm doing this kind of thing. Uh, and it just brings, uh, it just adds a little bit of tightness to each of these frequency ranges. So let's go ahead and listen. Uh, to what this is doing. Now at the beginning you can see it's not really engaging at all. There's not a lot of volume anywhere. That said it is, uh, there is makeup gain happening. You can see listed here the makeup gain on my highest frequency is 3.7 decibels. So it's actually bringing that high register up 3.7 decibels, which is important to note. It's not just a compressor. it's basically just acting as an EQ. It's giving me that boost, that 3.7 boost, uh, decibel boost in the upper register. Uh, in my high mids, it's just like a two decibel boost. And I think in the, yeah, in the lows, it's gonna be about the same, about two decibels. Not a huge thing in any case, but definitely an appreciable difference still. This is one of the reasons that you gotta be really, really careful when you're boosting things with EQ. And it's one of the reasons that this is not necessarily the best tool to use for this purpose. Um, I just find that it hits a couple different things and it makes uh, life a little bit faster when I'm trying to put the finishing touches on mixes. Uh, Cause right now you can see I'm barely compressing anything. The low end is getting compressed just a little bit. I'm mostly using it as an EQ right now um, to give myself a little bit more life in the high register and a little bit more uh, control in the low register. But you can see that I am clipping now um, I'm pushing it a little bit too hard. So what I need to do is just bring the whole thing down a little bit. And what I have to do at this stage is actually go through 
and lower all my faders. I don't want to mess with my master fader uh, until the very last stages if I'm finding that I'm having trouble with the dynamics. Um, I don't like touching the master fader. I pretty much will just grab all my channels and just bring them down a touch to give myself a little bit more space to play with. And I should mention that it is actually better to bring it down too much because we're going to make it up later. And I'll show you what we're going to do uh, in the last stage of this. To if, if I bring the faders down too far, that's okay. We'll bring them back up in just a minute. I just worry about tone right now. Great. I'm no longer clipping, uh, and I feel like that added a lot of uh, life, especially to that high register, which was getting a little bit muddy, um, especially with all the reverbs in there. I'm running a lot of reverbs. I like my reverbs to have reverbs. All right, now there's one more tool that I'm going to show you here on the master channel uh, to really help bring the uh, level of your mix to a good place, and that's called a limiter. And basically what a limiter does is uh, it's, it's really kind of an uber compressor, where a compressor says... If anything gets past the threshold, reduce it by a half or a third or uh, whatever ratio you set. A limiter says nothing gets past. You can see this value here, limit, is set to minus 0.1. Nothing will get past minus 0.1, no matter how loud I crank it. Um, so I like to put my threshold to minus 1 just to make sure it's not engaging prematurely. Um, I really am just using it to take the transients off, those little blips of noise that will shoot above the level of uh, clipping. So... What I'm going to do is actually bring, uh, I'm going to start to play it, and I'm going to bring the volume up to a point where I think that it's comfortable. And I want to go to the loudest part of my song and make sure that I don't experience pumping. You remember pumping from the second part of this uh, video series uh, is when something runs into a compressor, or in this case a limiter, and it brings everything down by a noticeable amount. Uh, now this is on the master channel, so everything will duck. So I'll actually exaggerate a little bit so you can really hear what pumping sounds like. Uh, so let me go ahead, good, all my stuff is still selected. And I'm just going to bring it up to a point where I think the level sounds overall pretty good uh, without a lot of pumping. That's my goal here. Okay, so you can hear when the, the, that little snare, those uh, snare hits happened, there was a little bit of pumping. I'm going to really now bring it out, and you can watch this, how much it's reducing the sound. You can see this value here will start jumping around. So I'm really, really putting a lot of control uh, on the entire mix. And you can hear that pumping happening now. It's really ducking a lot of audio. So it means I'm pushing the limiter a little bit too hard. This is not just a make it loud machine. Because um, I can just crank this thing full bore and it'll get ugly and gross and crowded. Uh, we don't want that. It'll just be pumping all the time. Uh, so I'm going to bring that back just a little bit. And again, I'm looking for a good, loud level uh, that doesn't induce pumping. So there's just one more thing we need to check uh, before we can really call our mix finished. 
And that's just to go through each section and make sure that the volume isn't doing anything crazy between sections. And uh, just do some a being with the plugins that we added to make sure that we haven't done anything that actually takes away from the overall sound in any given section. Because I've been very focused on the loud part. I haven't really paid a ton of attention to the soft part. Um, so just go ahead and take this from the beginning and uh, do some clicking through to see, uh, make sure that each section sounds good with everything that we've done so far. Huge difference at the beginning. The uh, multi-band compressor, which again is functioning mostly as an EQ, just adding a little bit of brightness, which I like. I'm jumping between the beginning and the end a lot. Um, it's just because I want to make sure that uh, it makes sense. I don't want, uh, because there's so much compression happening at the end, just limiting happening at the end, it's easy for uh, that material to actually end up at a lower volume and like my leads end up quieter at the end than they do at the beginning. Um, but it's sounding like it's actually pretty even to me, which I like. Uh, if anything, I might uh, on review actually take the instruments at the beginning down just a little bit. Uh, but overall, it's not bothering me right now. Uh, so I'm actually pretty ready to just go ahead and listen straight through this thing, uh, make sure that everything is good, and call it done. So let's go jump back to the beginning. We'll listen through the whole track one more time, and then we'll do a little bit of a post morb on this mix.
right. Overall, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, this is definitely something I would feel comfortable mixing or feel comfortable releasing. Uh, I may go back and do some review on it just a little later with some fresh ears because, again, I've been mixing for a while now. Um, I've been working on this for a little while now. Uh, and my ears may have ad adapted to a couple things, so I'll definitely come back to this before I call it officially finished. But I do just want to do a little bit of a post-mortem on this uh, whole process. Now, first of all, this is not exactly how I normally do things. Uh, for one thing, I wrote this piece in January, and it is now April as I'm recording this final part. Normally, this all happens within a very much shorter time, time period, which uh, definitely affects how I do it, especially since I'm typically mixing as I'm writing. Uh, I generally know how things are going to function, and actually the sound of it in the mix may affect how I uh, compose or orchestrate different layers on top of it, um, which is definitely what I would recommend you do as well. Um, this is just for some general thoughts on mixing uh, this whole video series. Um, also, I do not normally do any composition or mixing in headphones. Normally I'm on my studio monitors. That said, in the mix process, if I'm getting ready to actually like release something, especially if it's going to be commercial, I review the mix in a bunch of different places. Uh, I use my studio monitors. I have a set of uh, consumer level desktop speakers that I use. Um, I'll review on my nice professional studio headphones. I have a pair of earbuds that I monitor on. Uh, and the big thing that I find the most helpful is going to my car and listening to it in my car, both uh, while I'm sitting still and while I'm driving around, because nothing will mess up your mix more than a car stereo system, especially if you're driving it. Uh, there's so much EQ and balance that happens in that system that's outside of your control. And that'll really give you a good impression of how solid your mix is and how audible everything in your mix is. And the key is not to say, okay, I need to get it sounding pristine and perfect on every single uh, set of speakers that I listen on. The most important thing is that the things that are important for, to you, for your listener to hear, you want to make sure those are all audible and, at, and have an appropriate relationship to each other on whatever speaker system you listen to. So if something sounds amazing on everything except my car system, I still need to make adjustments and I'll actually end up sacrificing uh, some of the qualities on like a professional monitoring system so that it sounds nice in my car, both because pretty much nobody's ever listening to any of my music on professional monitors. They're just not. Um, if, if I'm writing for something, they're hearing it on their TV, they're hearing it out of their computer speakers. I mean, so many people listen to stuff just on their phones with the speaker playing. Uh, that's another place that I listen to it that I forgot to mention. I always listen to it coming out of my phone speaker uh, because just so many people do that. And, you know, I won't be able to hear every single little tiny detail that I composed or mixed, but I will absolutely hear if, wow, when I put this on a tiny little speaker, the lead is piercing and awful to listen to, and the bass is non-existent. That requires an adjustment. Um, and it may sound less perfect to me on the studio monitors, but it will sound good everywhere in that situation. Um, so that's the big thing to shoot for when you're listening to multiple sources uh, when you're reviewing your mix. So that's pretty much my mix process from beginning to end. Thank you so much to the Music Weekly community for having me do this tutorial series. If you want to see more series like this one, click the subscribe button below and follow the Music Weekly's community on Twitter. There's going to be a great series starting, I believe, next month from Chris Scribner, all about mastering. So what to do with your mixes once you're done with them. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Keith M here. Uh, so please post any comments or questions that you have below. I will uh, definitely be checking back in with these videos periodically to answer any questions that come up. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know what you liked about these, uh, about the mix pro this mix process and what you didn't like, what you do a little bit differently. Um, so thank you so much once again for taking the time to watch this video and I will see you guys soon.